Welcome, everyone. Um, we're starting, we got the green light to start with the workshop. Uh, we're very pleased to be here uh, hosting uh, with these 51 participants at the moment. We remind you, please, to keep silent uh, your microphone and your cameras off for the moment. Um, this is the workshop on regional bioeconomy as a key driver to build up resilient economies. Lessons learned from Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Gabriela Quiroga. I'll be facilitating this space of today with very um, high level presentations and the dialogue that we're going to have together here. I hold a master's degree in international development, development studies from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I am I hope you can hear me well. Um, there are some troubles on the audio. Um, but I was mentioning that I am a member of the Bioeconomy team at the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, IICA. We are headquartered in Costa Rica, in Central America, but since we are the specialized, specialized agency for agriculture on the inter-American system that supports the efforts of member states to achieve agricultural development and rural well-being, we also have as EECA different offices all over the Americas as well as in the Caribbean. The bioeconomy is becoming a prominent field of action of development strategies in Latin America and in the Caribbean region, striving for increasing value creation from their bio-based resources by applying bioeconomy principles and approaches. This workshop is aimed to contribute in providing a background and lessons from understanding and proposing the bioeconomy as a promising field for innovative change and a new economic development path creation by contrasting ex existing experiences in regions with different resource endowments but common challenges such as these related to the revitalization of rural areas. The workshop is hosted by IICAM and co-organized by the productive countries of the Southern Cone and other strategic partnerships are also here with us, represented by various of the guest speakers that will, you will be hearing in a minute. The workshop then, it's divided into three segments. We're gonna start with a general discussion of the main background and fundamentals for Latin America and the Caribbean approaches to the development of the bioeconomy, which will frame the workshop discussions. Then in a second part, there will be short presentations on actual experiences already underway in the region. And the final session, we will be focusing on the identification of priority issues in the region and remaining bottlenecks for future work, including regional cooperation opportunities. So we're hoping you, the participants, are looking forward to hear what we have to offer in this interesting workshop. 
So having done this brief introduction, please um, let's go and jump directly into the matter of the discussions here today. The introduction, it's going um, to be done by our um, guest speaker, Eduardo Trigo, and it's about what the bioeconomy has to offer for sustainable development in Latin America and in the Caribbean, setting the framework of the discussions during the workshop. Mr. Trigo has a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Wisconsin Madison, and it's an advisor of the bioeconomy and production development at the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture. He is a professor at the Center for Agribusiness of the Austral University in Argentina. And in the past, he has served as the scientific advisor for international relations at the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation of Argentina. As a member of the Academic Council of the Alberto Soriano Graduate School of the Faculty of Agriculture of the University of Buenos Aires, He's been director of the science and technology at ICA in San Jose and director of research at the International Service for National Agricultural Research, the ISNAR in Den Haag, the Netherlands. He also was director of the Grupo CEO, a consulting firm on agricultural and technology policy and management issues in Buenos Aires and has an extensive experience as a consultant on bioeconomy issues in the area of science and technology policy, organization and management, with emphasis on agricultural research and biotechnology applications to the agriculture and food sectors. Um, he is also a member of the International Advisory Council of the Global Bioeconomy Summit. He has published extensively in his areas of expertise. So please, Ms., uh, Mr. Eduardo Trigo, the floor is yours. I uh, remind you and all the other guest speakers that you will be having um, 10 minutes. And when you are covering already nine minutes of your presentation, I will turn on my camera as an indication for you that you will be having one more minute left. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours, Eduardo. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gabriela. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It is a, an honor for me to, to open this workshop and uh, in this uh, important occasion of the Global Bioeconomy Summit, which is the is a celebration of the advances in, in the bioeconomy. And I wish uh, all the participants in the, in the summit a, a very successful week. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that uh, whatever we discuss uh, during this week, it, it's going to have a significant impact uh, on the future development of the bioeconomy, a very much needed vision uh, in the times that uh, we have to to face in the in uh, in, the, in, in in these times. Uh, can you see my presentation? Hello. We can see it, Eduardo. Okay. Uh, well, the bioeconomy is about biological resources and knowledge, uh, and in this sense, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean are it's it's well positioned to take advantage of what this uh, division of the bioeconomy has to offer uh, for sustainable development. Uh, I make this assertion on the basis of on, on two bases. On one side, there is the, the resources base. Uh, Latin America has eight of the 15 mega diverse countries in the world, 22% of the forest cover, 28% of the remaining lands with agricultural potential, global, globally wise or worldwide. Uh, it is the region, the developed region with most. Uh, potential uh, agricultural land per inhabitant per, per, per person. Um, and it has 35% of the world's total fresh water supply. So on the supply side, 
uh, mobilizing these resources in a sustainable way uh, will be key. It's key for the regions, of, the regions economy, uh, the economies of the region, the development of the economies of the region. But at the same time, it's an essential component of the global of the global balances. Uh, and uh, the other issue that it's uh, moving or is supporting the development of the bioeconomy is that the region has uh, quite significant capacities in biology and biotechnology. Uh, particularly true in the larger countries, but uh, a number of the smaller countries have also developed uh, significant capacities and experiences in these areas. Uh, these two elements have made for the basis for the development of the bioeconomy, which has shown uh, already significant uh, results in, in the area of bio, bio energies, biotechnology, and in the development of large scale carbon efficient uh, production st strategies. Uh, regarding bioenergy, the region is the leader in export markets. Uh, it represents about 30% of all bioethanol production and uh, over 20% of biodiesel uh, coming from sugarcane, maize, soybeans, and oil palm. This has had a significant impact uh, uh, in the region economies uh, because of the, of the weight, uh, particularly in some countries uh, such as Brazil, where we will be hearing more uh, Brazil and, and Colombia, where we will be hearing more uh, during our presentation and, and later on in the workshop. Uh, but the most important issue is that uh, these developments have a significant impact in terms of greenhouse emission uh, reduction, and uh, even probably from the from the from the local point of view, uh, a more interesting. Uh, development in terms of what it's meant for the rural territories in terms of the creation of new jobs. Uh, I think that this uh, it's an area where, uh, as we will see later on in the workshop, uh, it's it's really one of the platforms uh, for the bioeconomy in the region and for, for projecting the sector into the future. Uh, the, the second area I mentioned was biotechnology. The region was an early adopter. Uh, and today is the leading developing region in the world in agricultural biotech use. Five of the largest producers of uh, genetically modified organisms are from Latin America, and four more countries are included in the list of countries which have already adopted the technology. Uh, in the right side of the screen, you can see the list of the countries, Brazil and Argentina are second and third, with almost 80 million hectares between between them, uh, with soybeans, maize, and, and cotton, uh, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia are all in the in the list of countries with more than a million hectares uh, in the list. Uh, Mexico, Colombia, Honduras, Chile, and Costa Rica are also countries which are already using the technologies. 80% of the total area of the major crops is under this type of technologies. But I think that even though that is important, that has uh, created significant uh, sustent for economic growth in the region uh, and for the consolidation of the bioeconomy, uh, maybe the most important issue looking into the future is the fact that there are close to market innovations from local research and, de and development, both private and public, in major crops such as uh, beans, sugarcane, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, these are, um, are already in the late state of regulatory processes, and in some cases, ready to come into the market. Uh, this showing how capacities are coming together to produce uh, new generations of technologies uh, in, in this area. And also another important thing is that it's a leader in the regulatory evolution for the new technologies. Essentially, we're talking about gene editing, uh, where there are already close to market varieties in rice and potatoes, among other crops. Actually, in rice, uh, there is a, a Colombian uh, initiative 
which is already ready to come into the market and creating significant benefits both for the pro for the farmers for the environment and uh, for food security given the the key uh, the strategic role that this crop plays in in in, in regional and global uh, food security uh, i'm sorry i think uh, i i did something wrong okay and in in terms of the carbon efficient agricultural production factories I mean, more than 60% of the total area under uh, large-scale no-till agriculture is in Latin America and the Caribbean. We are talking about 80 million hectares with significant uh, environmental benefits, uh, generating significant environmental uh, benefits. In the southern Cone countries, 80% of major crop production is under this uh, type of this strategy this, uh, this production strategy, creating a synergy with biotechnology, which has gener generated um, very significant uh, economic, environmental, and social benefits. Furthermore, a number of consolidating carbon neutral certifications process are already installed in the regions. Uh, I'm going to mention just the three that uh, are in the slide but uh, the list is long and growing every day. And proper low emission uh, beef, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the, 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 the most established ones. Uh, I mean, offering to the world uh, certified environmentally friendly uh, beef production, sustainable coffee in the case of Costa Rica, with significant reduction of uh, emissions in terms of uh, carbon emissions and a, uh, a, a significant initiative also involving the cereal exchange of uh, Buenos Aires, the Buenos Aires Cereal Exchange, that it's aiming to have under certification the whole of grain production, of agricultural production uh, in Argentina. Now, these uh, are the... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh sorry for the mishap um now uh, let me let me sort of uh, give you a brief uh, idea about the institution scene and what's been happening in the region uh regarding institutional development uh and i'm here i want to recognize the significant impact that uh, a generation a whole generation of uh, international cooperation programs uh, between the European uh, countries and Latin American countries under the framework, different framework programs, starting at the at the mid of last decade, in around 2005, 2005 to 2008, and then continuing until quite recently. Um, uh, this, these projects, um, which were, uh, which involved uh, more than 20 countries altogether, both from both sides of the Atlantic, uh, were played a, a, a really most relevant role in establishing the, the, the idea of the bioeconomy, uh, but not only establishing the, the idea of the bioeconomy, but uh, working together in a cooperative way to develop a Latin American perspective uh, for the bioeconomy. Uh, under the idea that the bioeconomy has a tremendous potential, but that there is no one bioeconomy, but it has to reflect that the bioeconomy to be, to be uh, successful has to reflect the realities of the environment where it evolves. And uh, I think that these projects, Algo Food, Algo KBV, Alquinet, uh, all of them financed under the framework program, or co financed uh, by, under the name, the framework program, and as I said, involving more than 20 countries, uh, have played a, a very significant role in, in, in bringing the bioeconomy to what it is today in, in, in Latin America. Uh, th these initial experiences, I'm sorry. 
I can't move my slide. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, we are almost there, so no problem. Uh, this um, uh, this is the map of where, where are we today. All these countries now have local strategic initiatives involving the bioeconomy. Some of them are partial uh, in what they took, take or they concentrate mostly on, on one or two aspects, but already three of the countries in the region, uh, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Uruguay, already have national uh, bioeconomy strategies and significant uh, comprehensive efforts in the same direction are already underway in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina, and in other countries. The bioeconomy from the, from the strategic point of view is a well-established concept and one that it's already mainstreaming into the strategic decision-making about development policies. Uh, let me finish now. Uh, and again, I lost the capacity to move my slides. Now, just with some uh, some overview of what is what are the issues uh, uh, on which we are getting now in the policy discussion. Uh, the first is that we are moving beyond the early science and technology focus that developed mainly under the uh, under the, the umbrella of the cooperation projects I I mentioned. Uh, where the science and technology sectors were the leading sectors in, in moving the concept and create and developing uh, the discussion and supporting the discussion. Uh, now, uh, the good news is that the discussion has moved on into uh, what it means for production, uh, for agriculture, for industry, for health, for the environment. And, and that is the big issue which has been reflected in the national strategies that I mentioned. The second area where we are making progress, and uh, it's uh, the recognition that in order to get uh, serious in the policy discussion, uh, you have to be able to offer numbers, the measures, what it means to move in the bioeconomy, what it means. And uh, there is significant measurement efforts already underway. Some of the initial ones were supported under the, the projects, I mean, the cooperation projects I mentioned, uh, the initial uh, development of a uh, satellite account in Argentina, uh, creating the first measure of the bioeconomy was supported under uh, the last project I mentioned, the Altnet project uh, at the time, uh, but now, the efforts have moved on and uh, there are efforts to measure, to create numbers so that we are able to monitor progress and to monitor uh, not only economic process, progress, but environmental impacts, uh, social impacts. Uh, and there are efforts in other countries, in Brazil, in Colombia, probably next in Costa Rica, already on the way in Uruguay. And, and the final point, that we are starting to discuss is that uh, we have reached the point where we have to institutionalize the vision within the policy implementation structure. I mean, bioeconomy is not only an idea, it has been reflected in how the, 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 the policies and the, 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 the get in touch with the realities of the productive world. And uh, in that sense, there have been some initiatives in the region uh, still quite timid, but uh, the issue has been recognized as, as, as one of the, of, the, of, the, of the next priorities uh, for the future development of the bioeconomy. With this, I end my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, you, Eduardo, uh, for managing the time as well and for an excellent presentation that already settled the scene for us in this discussion uh, on the workshop. Um, before we get to the next part, um, uh, we are very excited about the 70 plus participants that we're having at the moment. We remind you that you always have the chat where you are going to be able to 
ask uh, different questions that you have for the speakers. Um, but just now, we would like to invite you to go to um, to www.menti.com. One of my colleagues is going to show that on the screen. Um, please go uh, to that link um, in your computers or in your um, mobile phones as well. And please digit the code that we are now highlighted we highlighting with the red dot. And as you're able to do that, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, for you, the different participants of the workshop, that we would like you to be answering. We're going to use later on uh, the results of these questions by one of our guest speakers to analyze the data that we're going to get through this uh, brief survey. So please answer um, to these first questions, what are the factors that can drive the bioeconomy in the region? I see that there is already people into the www.menti.com. And I please ask one of my colleagues to write the code on the chat for the people that are trying to get into this platform and get into Menti. That you can see the code up here. It's 84525532. So if you put that code, you will be able to access and answer the questions the question, the first one, we have two, but the first one is what are the main factors that can drive the bioeconomy in the region? And we can see already a few people answering this question. We're not going to analyze the results right now. As guest speakers, Marcelo Rigunaga later on will take on these results and comment on that during his presentation. Um, previous to the panel that we're going to be having later on this workshop. So I hope you all can manage to give your answers to the first question. And I think in a minute, after you all answer to the first question, uh, we're going to have access as well. The second question, some are mentioning in the chat that they can open it. Uh, one of my colleagues is working on that and you will be able to have access to you answer the question and in the meantime we solve this technical problem please keep thinking about your answers what could be the main drivers for bioeconomy in latin america and in the caribbean we see now that the screen is moving i think um some participants are highlighting that it didn't work for them, the first question. So you might need to um, get back again to www.menti.com as we can see it up in the screen we're showing right now and you see the code here and as i see much more words in this cloud of words more people now it's effectively been able to provide answers to the second question which is what would be possible to achieve in the region through the bioeconomy we're gonna 
try to get back to the first question so people can have an opportunity to answer. But in the meantime, it's nice to see that you are able now to be answering the second question. What would be possible to achieve in the region through the bioeconomy? When we see the shape and the colors changing and the size of the words, it means that you are all getting there, luckily, in answering. Yeah. One of my colleagues later on is going to take on these results and make a comment on these results. So we're back to the first question. Please try again to get into the mentee and using this code and provide some hints for answering what are the main factors that can drive the bioeconomy in the region. So we can see now at least five of you are able to be answering this question. Let's hope for the same opportunity we had with the second question. There's something to be happening perhaps with the first question. It's not completely working, I think. So let's give it a few seconds to see if my colleagues are able to solve that problem for you to be answering the first question. And otherwise we go on with the rest of the workshop. Okay, it seems that for the first question, it's not really working. Um, sorry for that, it was a technical problem. But anyways, we got very uh, nice inputs for the second question. So as we said later on during the workshop, um, we're gonna take that on uh, for our discussions here. Thank you very much for your participation. So, um, Mr. Trigo, as we said, he did settle uh, the scene of the general discussion of the main background and fundamentals for Latin America and the Caribbean approaches to the development of the bioeconomy, framing indeed the workshop discussion. So we're going to go on now, heading to the second part of this workshop with brief but nutritious presentations on actual experiences already undergoing in the region. The working question that we're having for this second part of the workshop is, what has been the progress of the region in terms of bioeconomy strategies, initiatives and businesses? What is it important to highlight to show progress and potential? And we're very excited to have the next speakers that are gonna be talking about policies and about businesses. So, um, the second speaker, but first uh, for this panel, um, or this section that follows, is going to be Mr. Uh, Federico Torres. He is currently research <laughs> and director of the Ministry of Science, Technology and Telecommunications in Costa Rica. He holds a PhD in Business Economics of the University of Valencia, Spain, with a postgraduate studies in Information Technology from the University of Salamanca. Mr. Torres is Costa Rica's delegate for the Committee of Scientific and Technological Policy in OECD, and he is a member of the Health Research Commission, the National Biosafety Commission, the Atomic Energy Commission and the Sustainable Development Foundation, Sagesti. Torres is a full professor at the Costa Rica Institute of Technology. His research interests include scientific policy, bioeconomy, behavioral economics, ICTs, entrepreneurship, and knowledge management. You're going to have Mr. Torres 10 minutes to do your presentation. And as the etiquette has shown, I'll be turning on my camera when you are in minute nine, meaning that you will have one minute left. So Mr. Torres, the floor is yours.
Thank you very much, Gabriele. I am very glad to be here with you and share my presentation about the National Bioeconomy Strategy in this wonderful afternoon with this wonderful audience. Thank you for, for this opportunity to share our efforts in the development of our National Bioeconomy Strategy. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to commend that uh, this is uh, developed by the Ministry of my country, the Ministry of Science, Technology and Telecommunications, the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, the Ministry of Environment and Energy, and the Ministry of Economy and Trade. Uh, all, all of these institutions or other institutions in our country uh, has been working in this process to develop this national strategy for uh, the next slide, please. Okay. It's important to mention that we support from ICA is an uh, important supporter of this process um, from CEPAL, ECLAC from Biofin, from uh, some clusters of my country, and also the academic, academic sector of Costa Rica and the entrepreneurship sector of Costa Rica. Uh, all of the institutions support this effort, and that is one of the most important guarantees of success, uh, because uh, we collect a lot of uh, efforts and support to develop this strategy in my country. The next slide, please. Why bioeconomy for Costa Rica? Why we start this process with many illusions and, and scarce resources? Um, we start this process because we consider that Costa Rica has uh, a lot of uh, advantages and and capabilities to develop these processes. Um, Costa Rica has a, a, a very high commitment with this carbonization, a high commitment with uh, different trades and um, uh, different uh, status, uh, legal status uh, in Europe. Obviously, we consider this process a big jump to sustainability. That is our objective. Um, project Costa Rica uh, in a big jump of sustainability. We have a problem in the area of uh, territorial development. We have very different uh, situations and uh, levels of development between uh, different uh, regions of my country. And we think that we can address this uh, problem with bioeconomy. This, uh, this is other of the reasons that we started uh, we believe uh, bioeconomy needs uh, innovating and productive sophistication to be implemented, and we are better to this process and, and pursue this process in our country. And, uh, we we thought that uh, uh, this effort has to be more for circular economy, the development of circular economy in our country and continue the process that we start some so that we start some some years in this topic um, and uh, since uh, 2017 we are uh, we have um, a policy about the development of our society in costa rica uh, this is the strategy of bioeconomy is uh, uh, in line with this of my country to develop a, a knowledge to the next slide please it's important to share the vision that we have in the development of, of uh, the strategy we we pursue to build a costa rica with value added sustainable production in all regions, as I commented, 
and in all emerging biocities based on the fair and equitable use of the diversity, the circular utilization of biomass, and the country's biotechnological progress as an element of the knowledge society. As you see, uh, all the uh, different topics that I mentioned in the slide before is contained in this uh, vision that we have um, principles that we are working in this uh, strategy. The first of all, is sustainability and a, a high commitment with the, uh, the agenda 2030 in development. Always our commitment with the Convention of Biological Diversity and the Paris of climate change and the convention to add the certification. We are pursuing, pursuing in this process a very good balance between the social inclusion, gender, youth, indigenous people, and balanced territorial development and uh, get a balance with uh, innovation, value, addition, diversification, and productive sophistication. Generate green jobs and fossil decarbonization. We have to, to establish that trade to uh, get an equilibrium and balance between these two principles. That makes a slide, please. Um, it's important for us that our strategy is in line with uh, the SDGs, obviously. And each of the, each of those, of those uh, access of our strategy are in direct alignment or in a cross-cutting alignment with the uh, SDGs. And we are mature for development of this strategy based on uh, the SDGs and the measurement that we have available to perform this in our country. But the objective is to accomplish uh, the SDGs through the, the, the strategy of bioeconomy and other uh, reductions and policies that we have in our country. Next slide, thank you. I uh, want to share with you some lessons learned in this process um, and uh, our access and our cross cutting uh, in our strategy. As you see in the slide, you can uh, uh, understand that we have uh, five axes autonomy for rural development, biodiversity for development, biorefinery of residual. Mass, advanced biomass, in bioeconomy, and green cities. What, you, what is the lesson learned that we accomplished in this process? Uh, first of all, that is important a uh, holistic view of bioeconomy. That is our commitment in this process. We try and um, accomplish, I think, the development of a, a holistic view of bioeconomy in our strategy. We work a lot in the interdisciplinary, in a vision of interdisciplinary strategy, um, put together of different institutions and intersectoral alliances, innovation, governance is a very important topic in the, at the first of the process, at the beginning of the process. Urban and rural vision, we have to get up about commitment to society, we have to get a commitment to society. Circular economy as a concept is a, is a, is a central concept strategy. All of the businesses in, in digitalization and convergent technologies, and of course, science, knowledge, and education as tools and uh, opportunities to uh, improve our implementation of the economy in Costa Rica. Next slide, please. 
finally, um, we get some challenges and we have to face them. Some challenges for us is continuing to strengthen intra and interinstitutional as well as intersectoral and inter articulation mechanisms. Obviously, all the regions of our country, uh, of our country, South America, has uh, different needs and capacities. We have to we have to perform an adaptation for the needs of region in our countries to develop a plan of strategies, I think. Uh, we have to work a lot in the plan to the implementation. You know, the involvement of the industry is a, is a key factor in this process because the bioeconomy is more the product for the productive sector. We can develop it without the productive sector, but for the productive sector of our countries and promote that bioeconomy interface of biodiversity to get our goals. And we have to allocate more resources and develop an action plan to accomplish these challenges. The next step, please. This presentation that we have to, for this, uh, for this city, I am very glad to share this uh, information about the strategy and I here for your questions or comments uh, about the strategy of Costa Rica or the development of this strategy in my country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando, uh, for showing with us the experience and um, um, how much Costa Rica had made progress around bioeconomy. So now is the time uh, to head to the case of Uruguay. Um, and our guest speaker, we continue to be in the second part where we're hearing uh, different experiences from uh, the region. And now uh, our guest speaker, it's uh, Carolina Valian. She is an economist graduated from the University of the Republic of Uruguay. She has a postgraduate degree in economics and law of climate change from the Latin America Faculty of Social Sciences, FLAXO. And currently she works as an advisor in national resource economics and climate change in the Office of Agricultural Planning and Policy of the Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries of Uruguay. She's focused on the development and validation of the sustainable bioeconomy strategy and also has participated in the elaboration of the National Adaptation Plan for Agriculture, as well as in the international climate change negotiations related to agriculture under the UNFCCCs. Previously, she worked at the UNDP on an environment and climate change projects. So Ms. Valian, you will have 10 minutes in the minute number nine. I will show, uh, put my camera on so you will be reminded that there, one, there is one minute left. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriela. So I am Carolina and I'm from the Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries from Uruguay. Good morning to and good afternoon to everyone and thank you for, for listening to my presentation. So the idea of this presentation is to show a brief introduction to the process of, of elaboration of the sustainable bioeconomy strategy in, in Uruguay. So next slide please. So this, this process in Uruguay was carried out by an um, interinstitutional working group on sustainable bioeconomy that was led by the Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries in where I, I work, but also by other ministries as the Industry, Energy and Mining, Environment, Economy and Finance, Education and Culture, Jobs and Social Security, and also the Ministry of Tourism. Other two institutions that are cross-cutting are the, the Office of Planning and Budgeting of Presidency and the National Secretary of Productive Transformation and Competitiveness. So just to give you some highlights of Uruguay, if you go to the next slide, please. Our 
if you see our, our matrix of, of goods that we export, it is uh, the 80% of this of the value of exported goods come from the agriculture and agro industry sector. So um, almost 20% is cellulose, the other 20% is beef, and we also export dairy products, soy, wood, and, and other agro products. <clears throat> So to continue with the highlights of Uruguay, just to set the scene, Uruguay produces food for almost 10 times its population. So we are 3.4 million people and we produce food for almost 30 million people. Uh, the tourism and global services sectors are also two very important sectors in, in our income and GDP. So we receive more than one tourist per resident and we are lead exporter of global services as ICTs and uh, business services and trade also. Um, another fact is that almost 100% of our electric matrix is renewable and 40% of, of this total is non-conventional renewable resources. The next, please. So why is it important for Uruguay to develop the sustainable bioeconomy strategy? The first thing is that it is useful for coordinating national efforts towards a common vision of productive development. And this fact is um, nowadays more important than ever because we are facing uh, a global pandemic and Bioeconomy is a tool that is being used by Uruguay for green recovery. So for it's a tool for building back better. And the second point is that um, bioeconomy allows us to use the available biological resources in our country mm -hmm. and also the research, development and innovation capacities that are already developed in, in Uruguay and that are in a, and have an um, exponential growth rate. The third point is that the bioeconomy allows us to improve the sustainability of our traditional sectors as agriculture and also develop new value nets that are based on biomass. Another point is that all, all the, this transition to a more sustainable um, production and economy allows us to meet international commitments as the SDGs and the NDCs that are the nationally determined contribution, contributions to the Paris Agreement. And at last, it um, allows us to improve our international insertion based on environmental added value. And this is a concept that I'm going to develop afterwards. So how we, we got to a sustainable bioeconomy strategy draft. So as I mentioned, we created an interinstitutional working group on sustainable bioeconomy that is comprised by, by many institutions that are very important for, for this process. So we also carried out three national workshops involving the public sector, the private sector, and also the academic sector. We carried out a policy and actors mapping, and we uh, a very important aspect in this process is international and regional cooperation. So just to get into detail in this process, if you go to the next one. In, in the year 2015, so five years ago, the Office of Planning and Budgeting of, of Uruguay identified by economy as a driver for productive transformation towards 2050. So by economy and um, digital economy was the, were the two um, drivers that were identified when developing the uh, national development strategy by the Office of Planning and Budgeting. Then two years after, the, um, the Ministry of Agriculture of Uruguay signed a cooperation agreement with the Ministry of the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture of Germany. 
and Uruguay started to participate in the ISPWG led by FAO, that it's the International Sustainable by Economy Working Group. Then we created this at, at the national level, the Interinstitutional Working Group on Sustainable by Economy. We carried out our, our first national workshop in October 2018 where we arrived to a common vision of bioeconomy and we aligned all the national efforts towards promoting bioeconomy. In April of, of the next year, we carried out a second national workshop where we set the roadmap for, for the bioeconomy strategy development. Then we did the policy and doctor mapping with the support of the FAO. We started to integrate the um, Latin American network of bioeconomy, Bioeco Latina, with the support of IICA and ECLAC. And in our third national workshop, we defined strategic access, action lines, opportunities for bio based value nets. And we also carried out at, in the same month, in November, the ISPWG meeting in, in Uruguay. So from January this year to now, we we have been elaborating the sustainable bioeconomy strategy draft in this interinstitutional working group and we also joined in april of this year the idp working group on bioeconomy and public policies for latin america so now i wanted to show you a one minute video of this third national workshop that we carried out so if you can put play to the video Okay, so if you, I hope everyone could see the video by now. If you go to the next slide, and I'm going to be quick on the remaining slides because Gabriela is already on the screen. So uh, if I have to highlight four key aspects of this process, for, the first one would be to the need to think different outside the box. So we have to think on bio-based value nets and environmental added, added value. The second thing is to ensure policy cohesion. So there are many initiatives in Uruguay that have been carried out for the next for the last 10 years that don't have bioeconomy as an explicit objective, but they help to promote bioeconomy. And the role of, of the public sector is to integrate all these different initiatives and to complement them with with specific by specific policies for promoting uh, bioeconomy. The third aspect is to the importance to promote the coordination of public, private and academic sectors. And the last one is to define good governance for integrating all these important sectors and stakeholders into the process of implementing the bioeconomy strategy. So the next one. Regarding the first thing that I was mentioning of thinking outside the box, so we have to um, change our conventional way of thinking of, of lineal value chains and to start thinking on the concept of bio-based value webs. So these show the links that are created within and between different value chains as a result of the cascading use and the joint use of biomass. So in Uruguay, we identified and prioritized six value chains. One is waste and byproduct recovery, 
Other one is aquatic biological resources, food and drinks, forest resources, ecotourism, and chemical and pharma. So if you go to the next slide, you can see some of the bio-based bio products and services that we identified from the synergies that can be created between these six value chains. So for example, if you, if you think on a one byproduct that is from the production, comes from the production of meat, that it's a very important export product, product of Uruguay. So leather has um, a very low value nowadays, but collagen can be extracted from, from, from leather in the chemical and pharma industries to produce a product that is good for our health. There are many other uh, examples that I'm not going to, to mention right now because I'm short uh, of time. So if you go to the, um, to the other slide, the concept of environmental added value. So we think on this con concept as the goods and services that incorporate environmental added value are those in whose production the environmental quality is conserved, negative impacts on the environment are mitigated and ecosystem services are protected or restored. So this is an opportunity to differentiate our products based on their sustainability. So this can be made through certification programs as the, as the natural beef program certification and gives us a tool to access to, to more exigent global markets that demand sustainability on the production of goods and also allows us to give value to our national brand that it's Uruguay Natural based on sustainable production. So the next one, please. So the strategy has four main strategic axes. The first one is sustainable production and consumption. The second one is international insertion based on environmental added value. The third one is science, technology, and innovation oriented to bioeconomy. And the fourth one is inclusive territorial development. So to, to end my presentation, which are the next steps on, on this process of the sustainable bioeconomy strategy in Uruguay? So now we have a draft strategy and we are working on the political validation of that strategy. And meanwhile, we are also defining the formal institutional arrangements, so the governance of bioeconomy. And this is also being discussed at the political level but it's very important, as I mentioned, for the participation of the different sectors that are involved in, in bioeconomy. So the second aspect is uh, to deepen stakeholder involvement, to make sure that all stakeholders are, into, are in board for, for implementing the strategy. The third one is the action plans elaboration. So all of our strategic access have different action lines defined and when when elaborating when we start to elaborate the the actions action plans we have to uh, define specific actions in 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 those action lines for the implementation of the strategy and the last thing in which we are already working on is monitoring and evaluation and this we are doing it with the support of the international bioeconomy project of the FAO and also with the support of IICA in the construction of the satellite account of bioeconomy. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I, I, I steal some minutes from you, but I hope I was clear. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, for navigating us through the Uruguayan experience around um, bioeconomy policies in the country. Uh, we can already see that the case of Costa Rica and Uruguay just recently presented are triggering lots of interest from the audience. Uh, we can see a lot of questions about that in the chat. We continue to motivate you to share uh, the different questions uh, or suggestions that you may have through the chat. And we will be hoping that some of the, uh, the speakers later on will be, be able to tackle some of these, these questions in providing uh, some answers. 
So we're going to go on. Um, thank you again for being all of you there. Um, we continue on this section about experiences going underway around policies related to bioeconomy. Um, we're going to be also talking about businesses in a few minutes, but still um, we have one more experience about policies on bioeconomy. So we're heading now to Colombia. And our next guest speaker is Mr. Arturo Luna. He is a biologist uh, with concentration in biotechnology from the University uh, of Sucre in Colombia. He's a Fulbright Scholar uh, from 2011. He holds a PhD in biomedical sciences with concentration in microbiology biology, immunology, and biochemistry from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Clinical Pharmacy and Translational Science of this university in Memphis. He's a manager of science and technology in charge of the National Biotechnology Program and the Colombia Bio Program at the Colombian Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation since February 2019. Currently, he supports several efforts on bioeconomy at the ministry. So, Mr. Arturo Luna, you have 10 minutes. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Gabriela, uh, okay, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are now. Uh, okay, I will present you some of the progress uh, we have on the bioeconomy mission uh, we are putting together in the country. This is equivalent to the nationalist, uh, nationalist strategy of bioeconomy. Uh, we are working with different uh, government institutions, the uh, Department of National Planning, the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation, also the Ministry of Agriculture and some other institutions. Uh, let me see if I can control this. Okay. Are you seeing the second slide? I don't see it. Okay, now we see it. Uh, as you may know, uh, I think this is knowledge. Colombia is uh, has a great biodiversity. We're first in terms of number of species of birds and orchids, second in terms of number of species of plants, amphibians, butterflies, and freshwater fish. We are over 58,000 registered species in the country, although according to some experts, this is just an underestimate of the number of species we have, even including the uh, uh, microbes. We, are, we have over uh, 300 types of continental and oceanic ecosystem. 53% for uh, the land mass of the country is covered by forests and 50% of the country sea. We have coasts. To the Colombians, uh, to the Colombia's uh, green policy. Uh, uh, question: Can you see the the slide? I don't see it. Okay, now I see it. Uh, according to the Colombia's green growth policy, by economy is the economy that efficiently and sustainably manages biodiversity and biomass to generate new products, processes, and services with added value based on knowledge and innovation. Of course, we are also with the definition of the GBS from of the GBS uh, from 2018, and this is also um, uh, embraced by the Mission de Sabios from this Mission de Sabios or uh, Commission of the Wise, as you can call it. Uh, it was a group of uh, over 40 experts, international and national experts in different areas that issues some issued some recommendations uh, to the government, uh, including some recommendations in bioeconomy. What we want with this bioeconomy mission is not uh, to stay behind uh, the trend uh, that some other countries uh, are, are taking in terms of bioeconomy policies. Uh, what we expect is to have bioeconomy uh, become a new and powerful engine for business growth 
uh, that would add uh, about the GDP by 2030. Also, we expect that the bioeconomy contributes to build more profitable, competitive, um, fair value change based on science, technology, and innovation. And this is, this is a huge component of science, technology, and innovation within this mission. Um, we also expect to mobilize uh, over 5.4 trillion Colombian pesos in private investments in bioeconomy by 2030. The goal of the bioeconomy mission in Colombia is to promote the socioeconomic development of the country from and for the regions through the efficient and sustainable uh, management of biomass, biodiversity, and its ecosystem services for the generation of products processes with high value through science technology. And then we highlight the from and for the regions. Colombia is such a diverse country, uh, such a diverse country in different uh, terms that we have different with different resources, different capabilities that triggers the development of regional bioeconomies. And some of these regional bioeconomies can result in this uh, big uh, bioeconomy, the bi big national bioeconomy of Colombia. Okay, it's floating. Okay, it seems the lights are taking a little bit of time. Uh, this bioeconomic mission is also aligned with the reactivation the economic reactivation uh, plans and policies that are being drafted currently. Uh, you know, uh, the whole planet has, has, is suffering in terms of uh, economy uh, by the pandemics, and we need to uh, start working. By economy becomes a, a really good way of uh, for economic reactivation in the country. We have some commitments, for example, with clean growth within this uh, mission, job creation also. Uh, to improve the living condition of the most vulnerable people in this uh, in Colombia, and also come in with the countryside and peace with legality. As you know, Colombia suffered for a long, for a long time uh, by the armed conflict, and the people living in the countryside suffer the most. We need to find ways to uh, to improve the living condition of the of the of the farmers who living in the countryside. What we expect from from this mission is to increase the productivity, sustainability, and competitiveness of the country and the territories and the regions, to strengthen value chains, also in strengthen uh, research uh, centers, and also bio-based businesses, generate new businesses, um, um, and strengthen the ones that are already in place, and also to contribute to the fulfillment of the SDGs and some uh, uh, other agendas. We have prioritized different sectors within this mission. This includes health, energy, agriculture, food, tourism, and chemicals. And the way um, we are, like, we expect to fulfill this mission is by addressing different challenges, uh, five different challenges to, uh, to be exact. Uh, the first is the use of continental and oceanic uh, biodiversity for sustainable development. We have such a uh, such a big biodiversity, but we need to make a better use of it, better use of it. Intelligent Colombia that understands and takes advantage of this biodiversity. We need to generate more information from the biodiversity, but use also that information to generate new products um, and services, and also for decision making. Another challenge is called productive and sustainable agriculture that builds social parity. As I mentioned, the people in the countryside suffered for a long time from their own armed conflict, and we need to improve the living conditions. This, this can be addressed by um, improving the um, productivity and sustainability of the, uh, of the agricultural activities. Biomass 100, more value, uh, zero waste, we will add to this to make the most of the biomass that is generated in the country, mm -hmm. either from agricultural activities or some other activities. Advanced technologies for the health and well being of Colombia. So we need to use the technology we already have and the one we can generate um, to address different uh, challenges. And the, the way we address this public health challenges, we can also address, uh, we can contribute to the of this economic mission. This is the overview of the uh, mission. There is a great challenge that was identified by the Mission de Sabios. Um, and a mission within this challenge. Uh, the five challenges I mentioned, and each challenge is related to one strategic area that includes biodiversity and ecosystem services by intelligent Colombia, productive and sustainable agriculture, biomass and green chemistry, health and wellness. Each area is related to one challenge, but each area also can contribute to the fulfillment of the accomplishment of the other challenges. For example, 
Colombia can um, contribute uh, to the fulfillment of the challenge related to health or the challenge related to biomass or the one to the management of the biodiversity. Okay, the slide is taking a long time to load. Uh, we also have identified a different uh, um, a number of initiatives uh, can also can contribute to the to the fulfillment of this mission. This includes, for example, nature and synthetic tourism. Uh, there are some other initiatives in biological improvement, for example, with agricultural purposes, agricultural know, among others. Uh, this is just an example. And one initiative can contribute also with the fulfillment on some other initiatives, uh, all within this, the, the aim and objectives of this mission. In terms of uh, stakeholders, um, besides the commitment of the national and local governments, that it, we need the commitment of some other institutions, like the ones uh, like uh, universities, research centers, uh, startups, some uh, uh, big and small companies, and also institutions uh, related with the uh, business development and promotion, and also with the financing uh, in order to make this mission work. And of course, we need also the participation, not only of national, uh, but also international um, cooperation with some other countries. We have identified different areas of improvements in terms of, for example, funding market and regulation. That includes uh, the, a clear regulatory work uh, only getting with international standards. We need to work on this uh, quite a lot. Institutional articulation uh, in the country to uh, lead the bioeconomy, of course, with the corresponding budget allocations. And in terms of capital, we need to uh, train more human talent for value-added businesses in my economy. In terms of uh, funding, we, had a, we have identified different uh, national sources uh, of funding, but also some international sources. Uh, and some instruments like public-private partnerships uh, matching tax benefits and credits and risk capital can also contribute with the financial resources uh, to fund some of, this, of these initiatives uh, in bioeconomy in, in the country um, um, marked within the, the economy mission. And this is the final message of our bioeconomy mission. Uh, this is our country's commitment where knowledge, science, biodiversity, and biomass converge and become a powerful force for economic growth and social and sustainable development for Colombia. Thank you. Thank you, Arturo, for your presentation and also for this final uh, statement that, um, uh, yeah, help us to resonate a little bit how the bioeconomy policies looks like in, in the case of Colombia. Thank you very much. Um, so we have been having three uh, outstanding presentations about policy on bioeconomy in the Latin American region. And we are now heading to three other very interesting presentations about businesses. But before doing so, uh, we would like the audience um, to watch the following video that it's going to appear shared now in the screen. Um, and before to play into it, let me tell you that it's a video that it was produced uh, on occasion of the meeting of the Agriculture Ministries of the America that ICA organized, where the economy was positioned at the highest level and that it even gave rise to one of uh, different declarations and commitments around this topic and the, the need that we're having to set. Uh, policies and instruments for the promotion of the markets of bioproducts. So before we get into the next session about Cada vez existe más consenso que el modelo actual es insuficiente para lograr los objetivos de crecimiento económico, sostenibilidad ambiental e inclusión social que buscan los países. Un nuevo concepto, la bioeconomía, permite utilizar las nuevas fronteras de la ciencia y la tecnología para aprovechar más eficiente y sosteniblemente los recursos y principios biológicos. 
Los avances en la ciencia, la tecnología y el conocimiento permiten plantear nuevas alternativas económicas, sobre todo en los ámbitos rurales, como por ejemplo la intensificación sostenible de la agricultura, la producción de bioenergías o el uso de aplicaciones biotecnológicas para el desarrollo de variedades más resistentes, más productivas, producción de bioenergías o el uso de aplicaciones biotecnológicas para el desarrollo de variedades más resistentes, más productivas o la generación, por ejemplo, de bioproductos para otras industrias como la industria farmacéutica, la industria médica o la construcción. Para América Latina y el Caribe, la bioeconomía es una necesidad, ya que estamos obligados a incrementar sustancialmente la producción de alimentos, fibras y energías, a la vez que avanzamos en los objetivos de sostenibilidad y descarbonización. Afirmamos que es una oportunidad porque en nuestra región tenemos todas las condiciones biológicas y científicas para hacerle frente a ese desafío, promoviendo un desarrollo integral de la agricultura y de los territorios rurales que apoya a resolver muchos de los problemas de pobreza, seguridad alimentaria y desequilibrio económico, social y ambiental que se enfrentan en el interior de la región. Desde hace más de 30 años, en diversos países de América Latina y el Caribe, se gestan modelos de negocios que transitan por diferentes vías de la bioeconomía, aunque en aquellos momentos no se les llamara así. Hoy en día, algunos de esos países son líderes en las bioenergías, aplicaciones biotecnológicas para la agricultura, bioquímica, aprovechamiento de la biodiversidad, agricultura de bajo carbono, entre otras. Las bioenergías y sobre todo los biocombustibles líquidos, principalmente bioetanol y biodiesel y el biogás, son negocios de la bioeconomía donde los países de América Latina y el Caribe tienen importantes desarrollos. Esto gracias a que cuentan con abundancia de las materias primas que se necesitan para su producción, mercados desarrollados e incluso una industria de bienes de capital en crecimiento. Las biorefinerías involucradas en su producción podrían tener un efecto multiplicador en otros sectores económicos con gran potencial, como el de la química verde, el cual utiliza los recursos biológicos como plataforma para la producción de químicos, plásticos, cosméticos, fertilizantes, alimentación animal y otros insumos industriales. La biotecnología es una de las tecnologías esenciales para el desarrollo de la bioeconomía. La agricultura de la región ha sido una de las pioneras de este tipo de tecnologías con la introducción de la agricultura argentina en 1996 de la soja tolerante a herbicidas. Desde entonces, este tipo de cultivo se ha expandido a un número significativo de países de la región con distintas variedades de soja, maíz y algodón mejorados. Además de variedades OGM, hay también importantes avances en lo referente a nuevos desarrollos que van desde cultivos modificados más resistentes a enfermedades o estrés climáticos, hasta aplicaciones de mayor complejidad para la producción de fármacos a partir de recursos de la biodiversidad para el aprovechamiento de residuos de la agroindustria para la producción de bioindustria insumos, energía, polímeros y plásticos biodegradables para el saneamiento ambiental a través de microorganismos, entre otros. La región ha avanzado en el desarrollo y adopción de enfoques alternativos para una agricultura baja en carbono, donde ha logrado resultados significativos. Algunos ejemplos incluyen a. Los sistemas de siembra directa, principalmente en los países del cono sur, que hoy en día representan un porcentaje muy alto del área sembrada de los principales cultivos extensivos. Y b. Las estrategias para mejorar el desempeño económico y ambiental de la ganadería, como los programas para el desarrollo sostenible de la ganadería, la ganadería climáticamente inteligente o la certificación de neutralidad de carbono en la producción de carne. Estos desarrollos tecnológicos y productivos que han venido realizando los países de la región cobran aún más importancia en el contexto de la Agenda 2030. En este sentido, la bioeconomía se consolida como una de las respuestas para el desarrollo sostenible y una estrategia válida para el logro de los Objetivos para el Desarrollo Sostenible acordados en dicha agenda. En la actualidad, ningún país de América Latina y el Caribe cuenta con una estrategia o una política dedicada única y exclusivamente a la promoción de la bioeconomía. Sin embargo, es importante resaltar que existen múltiples esfuerzos que son de gran utilidad para este proceso. Por ejemplo, todas las inversiones, las estrategias y las políticas que los países tienen en promoción de la ciencia y la tecnología, en aplicaciones biotecnológicas, en el aprovechamiento de la biodiversidad, en descarbonización, en protección de los recursos naturales. 
Todos estos elementos hoy forman parte de esfuerzos más, más generales, más amplios, más abarcativos, que tienen al menos dos elementos en común. El primero es el reconocimiento de que la bioeconomía es el eje del desarrollo sostenible y el segundo que para aprovechar todo su potencial son necesarias estrategias, políticas e inversiones para promoverla. Para que la bioeconomía se consolide en la región es fundamental la articulación de políticas sobre todo políticas en los ámbitos del desarrollo productivo, por ejemplo, políticas agrícolas y políticas industriales, políticas ambientales, políticas de ciencia, tecnología e innovación y muy particularmente políticas orientadas a fomentar el emprendimiento, así como políticas de acceso a mercados. El tema del acceso al mercado es muy relevante para los nuevos productos de la bioeconomía y por lo tanto debe ser un elemento esencial. La bioeconomía le ofrece a América Latina y el Caribe un panorama donde su agricultura y territorios rurales deban ser protagonistas en solventar las mayores necesidades mundiales, tanto en alimentación, energía y fibras, y además, no menos importantes, ser motores de crecimiento y desarrollo integral para su población. Entonces, para aprovechar este potencial es indispensable que los países trabajen en la agenda pendiente. En caso de no hacerlo, no solo verán pasar de largo las oportunidades, sino que sus brechas económicas, sociales y también ambientales se podrían incrementar. It's quite big and we still need to uh, be making possible the access to markets for the bioeconomy products. Um, so without much uh, more farther said about this video that probably will you know trigger some other comments uh, in the chat. And we have seen so far that some of our guest speakers have been answering those questions and uh, that is something that we appreciate very much uh, that we could um, promote as much as possible the networking and the exchange among the audience uh, through the chat. Uh, we are now heading to uh, Argentina who is going to introduce us on their experiences around businesses in bioeconomy. So our next speaker is Ramiro Costa. He serves as Deputy Executive Director at Buenos Aires Grain Exchange, the Bolsa de Cereales. Prior to this new position uh, from January 2017, Costa served as Chief Economist where he preceded this, the Institute of Economic Studies, the Department of Agricultural Projections and Estimations, and the Department of Training. He is a member of the board at the Institute of Internal Agricultural Negotiations, INAI, 
the Argent also in that, at the Argentinian corn and sorghum value chain Maisar and Art Centrico, Argentinian wheat value chain. And as a year, the Argentinian sunflower value chain. He also participates in the board of the School of Agriculture, University of Buenos Aires Foundation. He's author of several research papers. He has contributed in the publication of several books. And in addition, he has presented his papers in numerous international conferences. He specializes in the analysis of agriculture um, value chain. So, Mr. Costa, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks, Gabriela, for introducing me. Uh, it was a beautiful video. It's clear that we have a shared vision with the ECAS by economy approach. Well, first, I would like to thank to the GBS 2020, ECA, and GPS group for the invitation to speak here today. It's a pleasure to me to participate in this conference and share the Grain Exchange's visions about sustainability of the agricultural systems in, in Argentina. Uh, okay, let's start uh, by describing the experience of Argentina, the early adopter of genetically modified crops. The first transgenic crop released in Argentina was in 1996. And the massive and rapid adoption rate of this technology makes Argentina be in third place only behind, behind the United States and Brazil in terms of the area planted with GMO crops, and thus a very important player in the international arena. The introduction and, exp and expansion of GMO production has occurred side by side with a significant increase of no-till practices. This led to the occurrence of a positive cycle of technological intensification. As we can see in the slide, this allowed significant improvement in water utilization, crop management, reduction in agrochemical use, biological pest controls, production cost reductions, and productivity improvements. All this was a favorable context to develop and implement a new strategy for sustainable growth in Argentina the bioeconomy approach. This strategy is based on the more efficient use of biological resources, technologies and processes to provide goods and services demanded by society. The implementation of bioeconomy requires a platform of key actors in which the productive sectors interact with ministries and public agencies, academia and civil society. Under the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange umbrella, we create the Bioeconomy Group as a specific private sector space dedicated to promoting investments in areas linked to the bioeconomy. One contribution of this group was the measurement of the value of bioeconomy for the first time in Argentina. It was a particularly important information as this sector has been rapidly expanding over the last two decades. Such analysis is contained in the so-called satellite accounts, which imply a reorganization of activities and products based on an interest which generally crosses several activities or part of them. The disestimation of added value of the bioeconomy in our country and its contribution to the GDP in 2012 represented 15.4% of total Argentina's GDP. A recent update of this work was made a few years ago. For 2017, the size of the Argentinian bioeconomy reached to an even higher number, 16.1 of the total Argentinian GDP. Okay, uh, in this slide, I'd like to show you the Argentinian sustainable intensification strategy. It is based on the conversions of innovation and good practices. Just to mention some key elements, I'd like to highlight direct seeding for soil conservation. In Argentina, there has been rapid and massive adoption of no-till planting, a system that also includes the use of biotech seeds, crop rotation, integrated pest control, and other activities related to precision agricultural agriculture for efficient use of, of inputs. 
Today, more than 90% of total planted area with crops use this technology that allows farmers to, pro to produce using less fuel and improving the soil quality, among other benefits. Now I'm going to briefly describe four initiatives related to sustainability in Argentina. First, I will introduce you about the Good Agricultural Practice Network. Good Agricultural Practices are a key tool to adapt and apply knowledge and innovations at farm level while reduce its impact on global warming. Second, I will describe the Agricultural Applied Technology Survey. This tool collects data related to grain production including information on soybeans, wheat, corn, sunflower, sorghum and barley in Argentina. The survey includes variables such as input use and the adoption of various forms of crop management, such as no-till production. Third, I will analyze the brand new platform, Argentina Carbon Neutral Program. This program aims to export food, beverages and bioenergies that will reduce and compensate for the amount of greenhouse gases emitted during their life cycle. And I will end my presentation by analyzing a grid ideal platform in which the Argentinian grain value change is working to reach zero deforestation in 2023. So let's start with the Good Agricultural Practice Network. Argentina was a pioneer in the creation of this network in 2014. It is integrated by the main public and private institutions in Argentina. More than 90 institutions are working together to promote good agricultural practices at field level. To achieve that goal, we train, we train farmers in how to use inputs and machinery correctly. We also have a communication department to address public concerns about food production. Another important contribution of this network is the elaboration of technical documents for each, for each sector, like grains, vegetables, bovine meat, and dairy. In this case, I'd like to highlight that each document was approved by the whole network. That means that the public and private sector interact, negotiate, discuss, and finally approve the documents. So good agricultural practices are a key tool to adapt and apply knowledge and innovations at farm level while reducing impacts on global warming. In this slide, uh, I'm going to talk about information. Information, we know, is a key tool for transparency, both in public and private administrations, and turns out to be critical when taking decisions at the company level. In order to make a valuable contribution for its members and society as a whole, the Grain Exchange has developed this tool to characterize the, technology, the technological profile of the agricultural sector in Argentina. Technological profiles have been identified for each productive region of the country and for the following extensive crops, soybean, wheat, corn, sunflower, sorghum, and barley. The analysis for each season includes the characterization of the technological profile of farmers in Argentina, assessing soft and hard technologies. This survey is a unique source of management, sustainability, and input use data for agriculture in Argentina. Well, now uh, I'm going to show you a new initiative that was presented recently, the Argentinian Carbon Neutral Program. This program aims to export food, beverages, and bioenergies that will reduce and compensate for the amount of greenhouse gases emitted during the life cycle. This program is voluntary. Everybody knows that public and private standards have impact on market access, as well as in our competitiveness, our production cost, and the perceptions that consumers have. Ten years ago, environmental standards were a plus, but today it's about not losing markets. They are a condition of access demanded by European markets, but which are also beginning to be seen in countries like China. For many years, we saw them as a threat, but now we start analyzing the opportunities they offer. In this regard, we decided to create this, this program. It has a part one, the implementation, that will include an environmental mapping of all the involved value chain products. This will lead to the creation of sectorial manuals for the calculation of carbon balance and good sectorial environmental practices. The second part, in which we will try to implement an, an environmental bond market 
to finance investments and generate tradable assets in Argentina. And we are going to have three possible seals. The first one is the, the one to belong to a working group, like the soybean, bovine meat, etc. The second one, certification of carbon balance, that is the amount of GHG emissions, uh, something like carbon footprint. And the final goal is being certified as carbon neutral. Now let's go to another, the last one, an important action regarding the private sector in, in Argentina. It is one related with a voluntary initiative where companies show their intentions to reduce or to eliminate deforestation associated with commodities that they produce, trade or sell. I'm talking about the South America's second largest forest mass called the Gran Chaco. Two thirds of it uh, lies in, in Argentina, 130 million acres. This forest is an incredibly rich ecosystem. Agrideal is a groundbreaking initiative in the soy sector in which companies, NGOs, banks, and research institutions have joined efforts to develop a free online territorial intelligence decision-making support system. The system helps assess risk associated with expansion of cropland areas, searching for regions of high economic benefits and productivity coupled with a low socio-environmental impact. Over the last 10 years, the total area deforestated and now under agricultural production has been only 0.11% of total Gran Chaco. And now the agricultural sector is working to reach zero deforestation by 2023. This information is public and please feel free to visit Agridial platform where all this information and numbers are available. So with this, I pretty much concludes my presentation. I think my final message is that Argentina's ag sector is on the track of sustainability growth, giving new opportunities to the agricultural sector with social, economic, and environmental benefits. Hopefully, this new agenda will keep growing and keep looking forward for integration and cooperation with the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Ramiro, and for this very uh, nutritious presentation about what is happening around bioeconomy businesses in Argentina, our thousand corn uh, of the uh, Latin American continent. So now we're heading um, to Colombia. We're getting um, uh, a little bit upper into the continent um, to hear our uh, next guest speaker, Daniela Sardi. She is the Fede Palmas Business Strategy and Marketing Director. She has a BA in Economics uh, from the Stanford University and an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. Daniela has over 20 years of experience working in Europe, United States and Colombia in marketing, business development, management and strategic planning in the corporate sector in the pharmaceuticals consumer goods and grape industries and in the non-profit sector so miss sardi the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes for your presentation thank you thank you very much gabriella uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone i am very pleased to be here sharing uh, with you the experience already underway in colombia specifically in the oil palm agribusiness and the opportunities we see with regards to bioeconomy. Um, my name is Daniela Lazardi. As uh, Gabriela mentioned, I am the business strategy and marketing director at Fede Palma. And in our unit, we strive to promote and foster a fluid and efficient commercialization of oil palm products through in-depth market, market analysis, differentiated marketing strategies, high value business development initiatives, and collaboration in public policy making. Fede Palma is the Colombian Trade Association of Oil Palm Growers and Palm Oil Producers. It was founded in 1962, and it strives for the competitiveness of the oil palm sector and the general well-being of affiliated oil palm growers palm oil producers, their families, and their communities. Uh, all of this through a value proposition that consolidates palm growing as a sustainable business and strengthens the institutional framework of the oil palm sector. Fede Palma created 
um, Seni Palma, which is the Colombian Oil Palm Research Center, in 1991. This to act as its knowledge-based technical and scientific support center through three major fields of work. These are research, extension, which is the transfer of knowledge gained in technology to put into practice, and technical services. Colombia is currently the fourth biggest producer of palm oil in the world and the first in America. It concentrates its efforts on economic, environmental, and social sustainability. Colombia produces around 1.5 million tons of palm oil, which is around 2% of worldwide production, uh, with an annual value of around $900 million in 2019. There are around 560,000 hectares planted, most of which is uh, planted in areas previously used for pastures and other agricultural efforts. There are over 6,000 oil palm growers, 86% of them being small smallholders of less than 50 hectares. It employs about 180,000 direct and indirect workers with 82% 80, formality in a country where there is 82% informality in the agricultural sector. Colombia will be able to produce more than 2 million tons of palm oil using the current planted area. Yet, the oil palm agribusiness has huge potential to develop new area without causing deforestation or affecting protected areas. In 2018, uh, Colombia's government determined that 40 million hectares could be used for agricultural activities. Of these, as we can see here, 23.6 million are suitable for oil palm cultivation. As you can see on the map uh, and on the table in the middle, of the 560 hectares that are currently planted make up only 2.2% of the suitable potential land. We are currently working on a dynamic system model in which we can appreciate the many possibilities of bioeconomy and circular economy for the oil palm agribusiness. If we look at the oils, on the bottom right hand side, we can see that they can be used for edible purposes, biodiesel and oleochemistry, which includes, includes cosmetics, cleaning products and personal care items. Some are also working on developing vitamins and phytonutrients. Another possibility that is being looked at with oils is the production of bioasphalt. This uses crude palm oil and there are currently some pilot tests in place and stretches with warm mixed asphalt. With regards to biomass, the main use is generation of electric power, which can be used by the palm oil processing plants and the communities surrounding them. The production of pellets from biomass is also being explored to increase the efficiency of the generation of energy, this to be sold to third parties. Yet biomass also has other potential uses. Leftover fiber up here uh, from the palm kernel is, can be used in animal feed. Empty fruit bunches and fiber can also be used to make certain products like paper, fertilizer, and wood chipboards. And there are many other uses of byproducts that also serve as raw materials for the chemical industry for pharmaceuticals, nutritional products, and biocosmetics. Waste materials are also getting attention. We have identified that oil palm can be incorporated into eight clusters, more than almost any other agricultural product and even more than petroleum, which is key for Colombia's export portfolio. With regards uh, to our experience in palm oil, we have seen that palm oil is highly valued in the edible oil sector due to its versatility and its functional and nutritional advantages. In 2019, the world production of oils and fats was 235 million tons of those Palm oils, uh, meaning palm oil and kernel oil, made up 36%, being the most widespread oil produced and consumed worldwide. 75% of, the, of these oils were destined for food uses, such as oils, shortenings, margarine, special fats, ice creams, and chocolates. In Colombia, the hybrid material 
O times G has been planted as an alternative to combat diseases such as bot rot disease, and the result is a new oil with different characteristics and a higher nutritional value. As we can see both from this information at the table on the right, uh, it has a high oleic acid content, which gives it its name, a high content of unsaturated fatty acids, low content of saturated fatty acids, good resistance to oxidation and prolonged he heating, and a higher content of tocotrienols with antioxidant properties. Approximately 15% of the oil palm area in Colombia is planted with O times G hybrid material currently. With regard to the use of palm oil in biofuels, Colombia has a national biofuels program which includes ethanol and biodiesel. And these, uh, this program has four fundamental goals. <clears throat> to develop the agricultural sector, employment generation, diversification of the energy matrix and environmental in, and improvement. The oil palm sector has been key in the development of this biofuels policy, with palm oil being the main raw material for the production of biodiesel. The use of the uh, B5 blend started in January 1st of 2008 and increased to B10 in the following years, reaching B12 by 2019. In 2020, the country had B10 with voluntary pilot plans at B20. And the government just announced that in the first quarter of 2021, the mandate will be B12 for the entire territory. Uh, from these pie charts, we can see that the National Biofuels Program has contributed to diversify the energy matrix of liquid fuels in Colombia from zero to, to 3%. Um, this, with palm oil being a protagonist, as it is gr a growing raw material and a renewable source in contrast with petroleum, which is depleting. In its final report, the Department of National Planning concluded that uh, the palm oil biodiesel delivered in all the aspects of the program fundamentals, generating great value for the country. It added revenues of uh, 4,700 million between 2008 and 2014. It contributed to the growth of formal rural employment in the areas used for production of palm oil for biodiesel. It contributed to sustainability through significant savings in carbon emissions, and it contributed to increase the percentage of biodiesel from zero to 3%, generating savings in diesel imports um, and an increase in energy security. The cost benefit ratio, the benefit cost ratio uh, was 3.31. We see that there is an important opportunity for the palm oil industry to increase its palm, uh, the blends, for instance, to a B30, like is done in other countries like Indonesia. The country produces enough palm oil for a B30 blend, and pilot tests with blends above 10% have demonstrated the advantages in terms of vehicle performance, which is important for uh, places like Colombia with the landscape, and favorable environmental impact. Finally, with regards to our experience with biomass, we see that the integral use of residual biomass to generate electricity, compost, biochemicals, and biofuels becomes an important alternative source of income, brings well-being to rural communities, and has a positive impact on the environment through the reduction in greenhouse gases. I end up by welcoming everyone to Colombia's oil palm agribusiness which offers a world of opportunities where it is clear that we must continue to dedicate lots of effort and resources into research and innovation, creating new technologies, technological reconversion, improving processes, and creating new business models that will allow the oil palm agribusiness to diversify and take advantage of all the opportunities of applying bioeconomy and circular economy principles and approaches, contributing in that way to the worldwide efforts on climate uh, change mitigation, and sustainable development. Thank you very much. 
Thanks to you, Daniela, and we definitely take that invitation that you're making us. Uh, it was really good to hear much more about the Colombian experience around these businesses. Um, so now we are um, heading to our next speaker, who is also going to talk about businesses in this case. Um, from the Brazilian experience. Uh, our next speaker is Gonzalo Pereira. He holds a PhD in molecular genetics from the University of Dusseldorf, Germany, and postdoctoral studies at the University of Sao Paulo. He is full professor at the University of Campinas in Brazil, head of genomics and bioenergy, laboratory and the international doctoral program in bioenergy. He is a member of the Academy of Sciences of the state of Sao Paulo and of several high level commissions in the area of industrial biotechnology, acting in the technical support to public policies. He was one of the creators and founders of Gran Bio, the first second generation ethanol company in the southern hemisphere. He was awarded several prizes and considered on the 100 most influential personalities in the area of energy in 2017. So Mr. Pereira, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much for the colleagues. Uh, for the invitation, very nice to see the initiatives in Latin America. I do believe that bioeconomy is the way that we have to, to have the world under a new management and Latin America will be essential in this new, in this new normal world, I hope. So let's go, let's, um, let's uh, talk initially about, uh, I don't know if you're seeing my, my presentation, uh, it's not changing here. Um, oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay. Sorry, we I, see it very well. it's not a, just a second. I will, I will make, I will make the presentation from my computer and not using the PDF. Is that possible? Okay, it's okay now? Yeah, I think so. Okay. To initiate to speak about Brazil, uh, it's it's very nice to see that Brazil become a scientific potency. We are a very high producer of science. However, we have learned how to make it, make it from money good science, and we need now to understand how to make money from good science. Yeah, and uh, not only money, but also um, to develop the country in the social aspects, environmental aspects, and so on, not only to have the, let's say, destructive way of the capitalism. Let's take the, the best of the capitalism to make an equilibrium in the population, in the, in the social conditions, and the environmental protection. So, for that, we do believe that we need the bioeconomy. The definition of bioeconomy is basically when you have the nature and utilization, regulation, protection, financialization, we can work in energy, environmental services, chemical commodities, drugs, cosmetics, and so on and so forth. That means you can reconstruct everything that we have been done by, by using oil in the last decades. And the industry in Brazil is is really going this direction. This is a, a book that we have wrote for the for the industry uh, organization. It's open to, to download and it has the, the general ideas about how to make money and uh, have development by the economy, by the bioeconomy. 
And our problem in Brazil that is improving is that most of our scientists, instead of being in the industry, is in the academy. We can make a great academy, but it has problem because the ideas and the inventions that uh, are produced in academy do not reach normally the, the, the production process. And that's explain why Brazil is a, a great country in, term, in terms of emprendership, but not of innovation. That means our entrepreneurs are not innovative agents, and this must be changed. So, the opportunity that we have in Brazil, um, in addition to the very good science, is area. Very good area for agriculture. When we look at the country, we, we observe that we have around 200 million hectares of pasture, low productive pasture, at least the half of them could be used for other ends. In addition, we have in the, in the north of the country, an arid region uh, that uh, with a very poor population or in general poor population, the poorest population in the country, that has a lot of sun and possibility to make bioeconomy. To be more factual, some years ago, a friend of mine asked me to invest in biotechnology. As professor, I gave him this idea. This is what normally scientists, professors done, a general concept of a business plan. And uh, what I, I wanted to, to show here, I wanted to, uh, to indicate with this, with this picture, is that, look, in order to have bioeconomy, we need to have a, a very good biomass to be transformed in second generation sugar. And from this, we can, we can reconstruct the petrochemical. If it, it is stayed only in the university, it would become a, a paper, a report. However, with the entrepreneurship and the companies, in few years from this idea, we have produced varieties of energy K. From this idea, we have produced the industry. And from here, we have produced the new microorganisms for the second generation industry. The results are there. These are varieties of energy cane, two to three times more productive than sugar cane. We have produced the best second generation yeast ever. In 24 hours, it makes uh, fermentation of uh, two, million, two, 2 million liters of uh, hydrolysate. And our company was considered the biggest startup in the country. Uh, and it is in the north, in the north, in this area where you have a lot of arid things. Bring development, bring very high technology. In addition to that, we are starting a new company. The name is Sertão Biomassa. Sertão is exactly the area, the semi-arid area in the north. And in this case, we want to exploit this incredible biomass that can be so productive as sugar cane and can be planted in arid areas, very low in valley. That means very good opportunity. Look what can happen with energy transition in Brazil. This is what is produced, produced today, 6, 6.8 thousand liter of ethanol per hectare. If you use second generation technologies and energy cane, we can go to almost 25,000 liter per hectare. When you look at the gasoline utilization in the world, um, we see that this can be, could be replaced by ethanol. And in order to do that, we would use only 75 million hectares. If you remember, we have almost 200 million hectares in Brazil available to make this transition. In addition to that, we are living now a possibility of a transport revolution. Uh, this is the fuel cell. Please uh, pay attention on this new technology because um, electric cars are very sexy today. However, when you make life cycle analysis, you see that these emit more CO2 than a normal car. And in addition, the batteries are extremely expensive and it makes no sense. Electric motors are great. Batteries are, are, are really an illusion. 
And uh, in particular for Latin America, this can bring a lot of problems when we begin a war around the lithium. But you don't need batteries to have an energy reserve because with the fuel cell, we could utilize biofuels like, for example, ethanol, methanol, methane, to be the battery. In this case, a CO2 battery. This is not a dream, this is real. Nissan showed us a prototype two years ago, and they are working very hard in order to, to bring this to the market in the next years. That means the use, utilization of the battery will be restricted to the dynamics of the electric motor, no, no, not more to the to us energy accumulation. In addition to that, Brazil uh, made really a very good thing with Braskem, this is a Brazilian company that's converting ethanol in green ethylene and producing plastic as good as the regular plastic, but coming from sugar cane. And in Grand Bio, we have also developed a new product, very interesting one, nanocellulose. This came from the, from the fibers of, uh, of the cellulose, which can be very, very, very small. And these very small uh, particles of nanocellulose are a great material to add to a various, a various amount of several different kinds of uh, recycled and uh, renewable plastics, which very frequently has structural problems. And these nanocrystals can solve these structural problems, making that these renewable plastic from, for example, polylactic, polysuccinic, and so on and so forth, could be used for, for everything, to really full replace the plastics. So, um, only to show how good can be the, the relationship between companies and university. This is my, my university, the Unicamp, University of Campinas, which, which has a lot of new companies, startups, producing over 3,000 3, uh, employment place. And uh, our budget as, as university is 2.3 billion reais, but only the, the, the outcome of these startups that come from Unicamp goes three times, four times this budget. That means we have a lot of new companies produced from the university, and I do believe this is the future. Uh, only to show you a little bit from our lab, from our team, and in pandemic times, our team is like this, yeah, everybody. And this is the future we believe. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Gonzalo. In the case of Brazil, it's definitely very inspirational for all of us, uh, full of innovation. Um, we are also delighted to see that participants and the speakers are already networking and interacting through the chat. We continue to motivate you um, to continue doing so. Um, along the rest of the workshop. We had covered already um, the first part where we uh, settled the scene and shared uh, the main background and fundamentals for the Latin American approaches to the development of the bioeconomy. And then we had uh, six uh, relevant presentations about um, the experiences already underway in the region related to policies and related to businesses. So we're now heading to the third and last part of this uh, workshop. It's the final session, which will be focusing on the identification of priority issues and remaining bottlenecks for future work, including regional cooperation opportunities. Um, this section is going to be uh, facilitated by Marcelo Regunaga. He will um, get back to the answers of the questions that we have shared with you earlier today uh, on the Menti. 
and he will be moderating the regional expert panel about the pending agenda. So, um, Mr. Regunaga is a professor and academic director of the formation and training department of the Bolsa de Cereales in Buenos Aires. He's a former Secretary of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries, and former Secretary of Industry, Commerce and Mining of Argentina. He's a member of several organizations and advisory committees, for example, the Argentine Council for International Relations, CARI, the GPS group, which is also co-hosting this workshop, the group of producing countries from the Southern Corn, and the hemispheric program of bioeconomy and productive development of ECA. In addition, he's a member of the steering group of the Global Bioeconomy Summit 2020. So Marcelo, I have now, um, I give to you now the floor to facilitate the next session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gabriela and all the organizers for inviting us. Um, first of all, first of the panel, I will just comment on the second question that uh, we were able to receive enough information and we can find there that uh, when we are looking at possible uh, achievements uh, coming from bioeconomy, most of you have been mentioning that uh, in the first term, sustainability. And this actually is very important for all the world. And actually is, is one of the biggest challenges. and bioeconomy is, is a good tool for that. In addition to that, in second term, uh, you mentioned development and health, both at similar levels. Uh, actually, uh, development is a, is a big challenge for Latin American countries, which are developing countries. So, and there are uh, other uh, comments on uh, economic growth related to, the, the, to that development. And there were some questions related to the problem that we have in Latin America related to uh, that uh, we have a lot of biomass and production, but still we have uh, regional uh, areas in which uh, development is, uh, is very little. So uh, this um, alternative of bioeconomy provides the opportunity, as mentioned Eduardo Trigo, uh, to create jobs and to uh, produce and process the biomass in the different regions. And this is a very good opportunity for the region. Having said that, you see that health uh, and associated with the COVID-19, uh, uh, health uh, is a ma major issue. And actually in many of our countries, uh, the health uh, part of the bioeconomy is a very dynamic sector. This is very dynamic in Brazil, in Colombia, in Argentina, and many other regions. And uh, this, uh, high, this problem, the COVID, highlighted the importance of uh, having strong investment in health issues related with biotechnology and other uh, associated developments. And coming to the panel, we are uh, having a panel including um, Guy Henry. Guy Henry is an agroeconomist, PhD from Texas AM University. He started his career at CIAT in Colombia. In 1997, he joined CIRAT in France and he and was expatriated in Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. He has focused his research on topics such as value chain analysis and competitiveness, international trade policy, sustainable food systems, urban food policy, and agri research strategy development. He formulated and coordinated various research and cooperation projects funded by the European programs, um, FP6, 7, and H2020. Actually, when uh, 
uh, Eduardo Trigo mentioned the development in Latin America. Uh, Guy has been an active uh, promoter for that uh, in all these those cooperation programs. He was pioneer in advancing the bioeconomy model in the Latin American Caribbean region, notably by coordinating the Latin American EU projects on this team. And in 2018, he was appointed CIDAT's regional delegate for Latin America based in Cali. Welcome, Henri. Uh, our second speaker is Bernardo Silva. Bernardo Silva is CEO of the Brazilian Fertilizers Association and co-founder of the corporate diplomacy consultancy think tank. He was the executive president of the Brazilian Innovation Association and founder of the Economy Congressional Caucus and the Brazil Bioeconomy Forum and Awards. Prior to joining this position, Bernardo worked for the World Economic Forum in its headquarters in Colony, Switzerland, overseeing corporate affairs and private sector engagement in South America. He also served in a variety of government affairs and advocacy roles within the Brazilian and the US governments. Bernardo is an economist holding a master's in international affairs from Tufts University, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and an MBA from Fundação Getúlio Vargas. He's member of the editorial board of the Industrial Biotechnology Magazine and Federation and current Biotechnology Journal. He's member of the South Paulo State Industry Federation, FIESP, Bioindustry Committee. He was the first Brazilian ever to join the World Economic Forum as a global leadership fellow, and he was named one of the top 100 people of the advanced bioeconomy in 2017. And now we are going to pose the questions uh, to the speakers. Uh, beginning by uh, Yi. Try the bioeconomy in the region. If you can get uh, into the uh, Bernardo, you can you can wait until he uh, concludes, and I ask for you, for you to come. Um, do you hear me? Yes, we don't see you, but, uh, Guy. Oh, there's the, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's there's a, there's a problem with the with the camera. Um, uh, then I repeat the the question. Uh, the first question I wanted to pose is, uh, what do you find that are the main factors that that, that can drive the bioeconomy in the region? um okay uh, that i wasn't scheduled to to answer this one but uh, that that's okay i think uh, one of the things uh, the drivers of the the bio economy um on on the one side there is the 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 the, the comparative advantage that our region has vis-a-vis -vis other regions in 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 the in 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 the world and i think that is the natural resources the the the, the biodiversity including the agro the biodiversity you know i think that is a that is a, a a major a major topic that stands out and that gives us uh, the, the 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 comparative advantages uh, another thing that i see as as a driver of late uh, and, and and i'm talking when i talk of late is is the, the last three to five years um that is the 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 conviction the belief uh, that governments have that the the agenda for the the global uh, development the the sustainable development goals could be 
um, the bioeconomy model could be used to address these these uh, these goals and i think that is a new opportunity and very late uh, a very late um, uh, another opportunity and a driver what i see is is covid uh, again uh, uh, we all know business as usual will not be possible and i think governments uh, uh, are, are 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 seeing that the bioeconomy model could be an opportunity to 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 go forward uh, after after covid i think uh, those are those are the three that i would come up with at, at this point uh, back to you marcelo thank you guy um, uh, now uh, we would like to ask to Bernardo Silva what would be possible to achieve in the region through the bioeconomy. Bernardo, you have the floor and you can come. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ika and the Global Bioeconomy Summit for the invitation to be here. Uh, I, I, I'd like to start with a, a thought-provoking question. So, uh, not, not, not even a question, a statement, right? So, uh, we know our, our biodiversity is valuable. We know that what can be done with the amount of cheap, abundant biomass that we have available, we know we have competitive advantages in agriculture, and also we know the positive externalities of the bioeconomy. So food security, climate change mitigation, innovation, health. Uh, but knowledge is only potential. Uh, uh, action is what makes it powerful. And building on Gonzalo's uh, previous uh, presentation, I, I think we can achieve, well, sky is the limit for what we can achieve in Latin America, in my opinion, possibly being uh, very optimistic. But given that uh, the market size of any industry or, or, or business is related to the size of the challenges that they're trying to, to resolve, uh, we can understand that the bioeconomy is one of the largest opportunities for Latin America for its development. But we cannot, we cannot stop with knowledge. We must have entrepreneurs. We must have government building uh, policies and a clear vision for a country or a region and establish very concrete milestones for us to really tap into the, the potential that uh, the bioeconomy brings into the region. So uh, I think uh, I'm very optimistic. I think the presentations given uh, previously shows clearly shows that. So for, uh, for me, the sky is the limit. Thank you, Bernardo. Now we return to Guy and um, how do you find how to scale the lessons learned and the political and business experiences of the bioeconomy that already exist in the region? Marcelo, um, that's a, that's an important question. Um, I would I would start to to go back to this comparative advantage that we have in the region, the biodiversity, and the potential for for value adding. Um, however, when I talk about biodiversity and, and beyond agrobiodiversity, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is deforestation. And that word we haven't heard today in this in this in this in this uh, uh, workshop. And however, it's a word that we see every day in the newspaper. Um, I think uh, with the reduction of the the the, the forest uh, through deforestation for many many regions, at the same time we reduce the potential of the biodiversity 
uh, 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 value adding. Uh, so that is a, a hell of a, a, a topic and that has many connotations and that should be number one on, on, on our list. Um, talking about lessons learned and I think that is again linked to the, the, the biodiversity, something that we can scale up and that we can sort of as an expert product is the, the non-timber forest products. Um, the, 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 the large experience that we have in, in, in Latin America, in, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Peru, in, in, in Venezuela, all over the place, um, is something that, 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 that can be exported. For example, Natura, uh, um, the way they have constructed their business model from sourcing in the middle of the jungle to exporting to penetrating of new export markets is something that can be scaled up um, uh, in, in, a, in, an, in an international sense. Uh, another thing that has been mentioned by Eduardo, that has been mentioned by others, zero tillage. Zero tillage um, uh, is something uh, very much uh, uh, adopted in, in the southern cone going up to, to, to other regions of, of Latin America, but again is already exported and, and we see it in South Africa and, 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 other, and other regions there. Uh, another, uh, and I will, I will uh, close there, ecosystem services. We use the word, but I mean, the, there's many, many uh, uh, sub products and sub activities in under the ecosystem services family and for example just one of them uh, ecotourism uh, is ecosystem services who was the pioneer of that costa rica uh, and i think that again is an is an export product that can be that can be scaled up and uh, well i leave it there marcelo well thank you very much Guy. Um, Bernardo, you would like to add something uh, to what already mentioned Guy in relation to how to scale lessons learned uh, in Latin America? Sure. Uh, I, I, I believe that Latin America has to uh, partner uh, and look inside and partner with the different countries that are doing different things in different levels. And why not uh, create clusters? We, we understand that in the regions where the, at, at least the advanced bioeconomy is flourishing, we have this very synergetic e ecosystem between governments, business and uh, academia. Uh, we see that in France, for example, we see that in Germany, for example, and other uh, regions in, in Scandinavia with the forest sector. Uh, why not do that here in Latin America with the ag sector? Uh, so there are many lessons learned, uh, not only internationally, but within Latin America that could be uh, re revamped and uh, uh, rescaled. Uh, we see, for example, a very successful case in Embrapa, where they not only bring in PhDs from around the world to collaborate in, in scientific projects, and they do have very close collaboration with the private sector, because as, as mentioned, knowledge in science is only potential if business cannot translate that into innovation, into market, into value, and to revenue and jobs and so on and so forth. So we, we see the very successful case coming from Brazil in Embrapa and possibly why not have that collaboration throughout Latin America focusing on an advanced bioeconomy. Thank you very much. Adding to this, I would like to highlight that uh, now when you look at the uh, farm to fork uh, uh, the program in the European Union, you, we find that uh, in South America, we, we have developed a production system that has been mentioned by uh, Ramiro Costa, 
which uh, is much less intensive in the use of uh, energy and chemicals and this could contribute uh, for many other regions in the world in terms of uh, how to have an intensific as, as you may have developed that uh, name in Brazil, the intensification system, sustainable system. And coming to the last question to both, um, what are the main bottlenecks that need to be solved? G? Marcelo, um, it, it, it always it always throws me a bit when 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 we talk about the region, huh? uh, because the the region is 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 is, is so um, uh, asymmetrical. It's so different, so uh, varied that it's 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 tough to talk about the region and and make a statement. Um, however, I would say that the bottlenecks uh, are, are, could be characterized in, in two families. I see on the one, the, 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 the public sector um, uh, related um, uh, uh, themes, and on the other side, it's the public private sector. Um, on, the, on, the, on the public side, it's the public policies, norms and regulations that I see that are sort of hampering um, the, the 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 acceleration of of the bioeconomy, um, starting with, for example, deforestation. That by itself is is a mega a, a mega bottleneck that needs to be resolved. But at the same time, it's the norms and regulations for the use, either for research or for 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 commercial use of the genetic resources that in many countries have are, are very are very uh, uh, cumbersome and 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 put up enormous thresholds uh, then and already the two brazilian colleagues have been mentioning this uh, the integration of academia and industry uh, public privates in, in in certain cases is of tremendous Im importance and obviously how come the the brazilians have have been mentioning this because typically and I was part of Unicampe, for example, for five years. Uspe Unicampe are the, the, the incredible platforms where they have all these these foundations that 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 fas facilitate uh, the integration and the valorization of university results uh, and the and the and the and the, the, the startups and the spin-offs they, they they have. Uh, that is in many other countries not the case i mean uh, and, and therefore governments should be able to come up accelerate more and, and more volume the incentives too uh, in order for the the, the 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 universities to integrate to talk to 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 get a, a, a common language with the the the, the industries uh, and i think um and that, uh, as, as, as colleague uh, Bernardo Silva has mentioned, um, the opportunities for, for clusters, opportunities between the regions, uh, not only in Latin America, but Latin America, Europe, Latin America, um, the US, uh, um, as, as Eduardo Trigo has been mentioning, the whole implementation, no, the implantation, um, the introduction of the bioeconomy model was done by EU uh, 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 LAC uh, 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 platforms that were that were financed by the by the EC. I leave it with that, uh, uh, Marcelo. Thank you, Guy. Bernardo. Uh, I completely agree with Guy uh, when he says that the the it's tough to to make a diagnostic of the bottlenecks in Latin America, given the uh, great biodiversity of, uh, of people, uh, companies, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to just maybe put in some views focusing on, on Brazil, where I have more expertise, which could help uh, translate into other countries and region of, of Latin America. Uh, policy for, for a long time was a big problem, uh, and I think Brazil is 
maybe a few steps ahead of, a few, of other Latin America countries in this regard. Uh, over the past 10 to five years, we've modernized the regulatory framework, passed on very interesting policies, uh, the, the biodiversity policy, the, the national biofuels policy, which uh, are creating the framework for uh, and the environment for these technologies and, and this economy to flourish in the country. So uh, I, I don't think, at least in Brazil, policy is the main reason uh, or the main bottleneck. For me personally, I believe that financing uh, is one of the greatest bottlenecks. Uh, it's very not. It's very tough to innovate in Brazil. Very costly to innovate in Brazil. We don't have uh, e either government uh, sources of financing uh, that could uh, that are directed and constricted with the very uh, the, the very particular uh, economy that we are dealing with. The very particular. Uh, sector that we are dealing with. We cannot, for example, use uh, funding mechanisms that are uh, geared towards uh, traditional economies, which are very proven uh, technologies, don't have high risk, and, and so on. So we see that a lot in Brazil. We see the De Development Bank, for example, uh, just packaging financing mechanisms that were used in traditional uh, sectors for the use in the bioeconomy, biotechnology sector, which is completely different. We need a patient uh, capital to, to for not only technology, but also companies and innovation to, to flourish. I, I think also that uh, venture capital is a very important uh, issue that we have to address here in Brazil. Uh, in places like Boston, San Diego, uh, France, and so on, they have a very sophisticated venture capital uh, ecosystem that is focusing on biotechnology and innovation and uh, have the expertise, the knowledge, and the resources to invest in these early stage companies and startups. So uh, if, if we can solve the funding part, mm. the regulations are there and already open doors for the bioeconomy to flourish here. Well, uh, thank you very much for both uh, panelists. I also want to thank uh, all the participants. Um, this has, very, has been a very interesting uh, session. I think that uh, if you are interested in Latin America, I invite you to a spotlight uh, prepared by ICA that will be on Thursday, 4.30. And then thank you for ev everybody and we close here the sessions. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Guy. Have a great weekend, everyone.